Well, hey, welcome to Center Church. My name is Josh Miller. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest, if you're new with us, welcome. We are really, really glad that you're here. Uh, you may not know if uh, you didn't grow up in church or don't have much of a church background that today's the second Sunday of Advent, okay? The second Sunday of Advent. The word Advent means coming or arrival. And it's the four weeks leading up to Christmas, this Christmas that historically the church has set aside to prepare for the Christmas season. Now, um, I don't know about you, but when I got married, I realized that families prepare for Christmas differently, okay? Can I get any testifying to that, right? Right, families first. So, all right, my wife's family puts the Christmas tree up and decorates the house the day after Thanksgiving, okay? It's like the turkey's still in the fridge and the tree is up. <laughs> my family didn't always get the tree up until Christmas Eve. Like, not because it was a tradition, but because we were disorganized, okay? It's like, oh man, we gotta go get a Christmas tree. What's left? Is it on discount? You know, the whole thing. Okay, so I don't know how your family prepares uh, for the Christmas season, uh, but we as a church wanna help you prepare for the meaning of Christmas, okay? We wanna help you prepare spiritually as you go about all the good and fine things and preparing practically for, man, time with family and travel and, and parties and gifts and all that's good. And we love all that. We want to also, man, help you as a church prepare spiritually for the Christmas season. We remember the coming of Christ, okay? And we've got a couple of different things going on this December to help you do that. So when you came in, there was a card on your seat called December at Center. On the front, it says that. On the back, it's got some information about a couple of different things that are happening in the life of our church this December, okay? You, you want to be aware of these. There's some really cool stuff going on. Uh, on December 16th, we're hosting a movie night here in our auditorium. We're going to be showing the newest iteration of The Grinch, which is the best iteration of The Grinch. Uh, can I get an amen on that? And uh, man, it's just going to be a great time for if, if you have kids, if you're young at heart, if you have friends that have kids, man, come kick off Christmas break with us. We're going to have a free concession stand. It's going to be a whole lot of fun in here Friday, December 16th. Make some memories with your church family. Uh, then on uh, Thursday, December 22nd, we're going to be hosting candlelight Christmas services here at our facility, okay? We're really excited about that. 5.15 and 6.45, just a time to, man, come and sing some of the hymns of the ages that, man, believers have sung for years and years and years to prepare uh, for the, the incarnation. And then we're going to, man, look at the Christmas story and we're going to finish things off uh, under candlelight. It's going to be a really special night. And at the end of the month, we are going to take up a special missions offering that's going to go to three different mission partners that we're going to introduce you to this month. So if you're here last week, you got to meet Tanner Hogue. Tanner is our North American church planner for this year. He's planning a new gospel-centered church in Norfolk, Virginia that we're really, really fired up about. So we're gonna come alongside and support him financially. You're gonna to get to meet some other folks in the coming weeks that all that is gonna to go to. All right, so it's gonna be, man, a really, really fun, really, really important December here at our church. And man, I would love for you to participate in those things because I think they're gonna be really worth it. All right, so what I wanna do is let's just pray. Let's just kind of take a second uh, and man, ask God to help us in this season, really fix our hearts on the incarnation. And then we'll jump into John 6 for today. Lord, I thank you for this time of year that, that we set aside to remember uh, the coming of Christ and all that that means about your heart for us and all that means about the hope that we have even in the midst of hardship. So guys, we look at John 6, which is in a lot of ways a familiar passage, uh, but a passage that shows us a lot about your character. Would you help us to see it with fresh eyes? Would you help me to speak clearly? Would you help me to, to be helpful? And I pray that you give us ears to hear what you have to say to us. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, you can meet me in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, we're going to be in verses 1 through 15 today. Uh, we're in a series that we're calling Come and See. Uh, and the big idea of the series is that we all have a cultural understanding of Jesus, right? It's been shaped by movies we've seen and pictures we've seen and maybe Sunday school classes that you were in. But what we're after in this series is not our cultural understanding of Jesus, but the scriptural picture of Jesus. Who is Jesus according to the scriptures? And so we've been walking through different interactions that Jesus has in the Gospel of John to learn that. And today we come to one of his most famous interactions in all of the Bible, okay? The feeding of the 5,000. So if you grew up in church, man, you're probably familiar with this event. Even if you don't have a church background, you might be familiar with this event. In fact, this is the only miracle outside of the resurrection of Christ that's included in all four gospels. Okay, fun Bible fact. So it's an important event, all right? It, it, it's a significant event. It, it teaches us something important about Jesus, but I'm not always sure that I've known what it's supposed to teach me. Right? You, you, you follow me? It's like, okay, Jesus fed a whole bunch of people a long time ago. What am I supposed to do with that today? And so we're going to try to really get into it a little bit and underneath of it, be like, what does this teach us about the character of God? And, and what does that teach us about, man, our lives today? And, and fundamentally and functionally, this story is about one thing. It's about a bunch of people being hungry. Okay? Raise your hand if you like being hungry. Who likes being hungry? Anybody? 
I don't even like thinking about being hungry, okay? Um, so this is embarrassing, but have you ever woken up at like three in the morning, you have to go to the bathroom and you wake up and you're like, dang it, I'm hungry. Does you know that happen to anybody? And you're like, oh, and it's like too late. I'm not going downstairs to the refrigerator. I will preemptively, I will preemptively satisfy my hunger by eating before I go to bed. It's like, man, I'm not that hungry, but it's like 9.45, I'll bet I'll be hungry at three. I'm eating a, you know, a thing of yogurt or whatever, okay? So uh, I don't even like the, the threat of being hungry. Um, I, was at, I was at breakfast at Chick-fil-A with one of our college students. And he's like, he's a great guy. He's like a pretty trim kind of slim guy, you know, not like a big football player or something. And he goes up to the, uh, goes up to the register and he says, yes, I would like 20 chicken minis. And the woman started laughing. She was like, okay, what do you really want? He's like, no, I want 20 chicken minis. And he proceeded to eat 20 chicken minis. And I was like, that's a guy who doesn't like being hungry. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, the truth is, I don't think anybody here would say, yes, I love being hungry. None of us do. So here's what happens. You've got a whole bunch of people that are hungry, like 5,000 men, which means probably 10 to 20,000 total people. They don't have any food. They're very, very hungry. So there's a lot of people. There's a little amount of food, okay? There's just little tiny uh, lunch that this kid offers. Jesus takes that small lunch and he multiplies it so that every single person there can eat and is satisfied, all right? That's kind of a summary of what happens. So, so here's the question. What's the point? Okay, like what's the point of this event? Of all the miracles Jesus could have performed, why do this one? Of all the things that John could have chosen to include in his gospel, why did John include this event? Right? Is it a direct application to your life today? Right? Is the application of this story that when you're hungry, Jesus will feed you? Right? Well, that would be nice. But haven't we all experienced the opposite? I mean, have, have it, whether it's literal hunger or more, more, more metaphorical hunger for romance or marriage or children or relational peace or a better job or you know, a relief of your, of your mental health challenges or for reconciliation with your estranged family members, I mean, haven't we all felt a hunger that Jesus hasn't satisfied? Right? So if the point of this text is A to A application of Jesus fed a big crowd then and he will feed you today, then this text is obviously not true, right? Because we, we have all experienced the opposite. But I don't think that's the point. I, I don't think the point of this text is that Jesus will always satisfy our hungers in life. I think the point is this, that Jesus sympathizes with our practical hunger, but came to satisfy our eternal hunger. That Jesus sympathizes with our practical hunger, but came to satisfy our eternal hunger. So this was what I would say. If you're here this morning and you find yourself hungry, right? If, if you are in need of change, if you are in need of hope or satisfaction, I think that this text is going to be an encouragement to you because it's going to show us something really, really remarkable and important about the character of God. All right, so we're just going to walk through it verse by verse. I'm going to try to help us see that this morning, okay? Look at verse 1 with me. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. So in John chapter 5, Jesus was in Jerusalem for a festival. We don't know which festival exactly. We think it was the festival of booths, okay? We're told in John chapter 6 that it is now the week of the Passover, all right? Well, Passover happened six months after the festival of booths. So it's been at least six months since John chapter 5 ended. It could have been more months if it wasn't the festival of booths, if it was something else, okay? And we know from the other gospels that a lot has happened in the six months that has elapsed between the end of John 5 and the beginning of John 6. Jesus has moved geographically, okay? He's no longer down south in Jerusalem. He's now up north around the Sea of Galilee, okay? And his ministry has exploded. So he's been, man, teaching and preaching. He's been healing. He's been delivering people from oppression. And at this point, you see in the text that great multitudes of people were following him around. And so we're going to learn later in this text that there's 5,000 men, you add in women and children, you've got a crowd of 10 to 15,000 people that are following Jesus. So try to get in your mind's eye like John Paul Jones Arena, right? If, if John Paul Jones Arena was packed and all those people were just following Jesus around, Okay, so this, this, is a, this is a phenomenon. I mean, this is a movement. People are talking about this. Roman political officials are getting wind of this because 15,000 people are wandering through their territory. I mean, this is a big deal that's happening. Okay, so a whole lot has happened between John 5 and John 6. All right, verse 3. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So Jesus goes up on one of the high hills that surrounds the Sea of Galilee. And we don't know why. Maybe it's so he could kind of see the crowd coming and they could hear him. You know, that's a lot of people to deal with. Um, and it says that he sat down. 
Now, here's a kind of little fun fact. In the first century, when a rabbi wanted to teach in an official capacity, he would sit down in the midst of his disciples. Isn't that something? So why don't we try this? Why don't I sit down for 45 minutes and all of you stand up? How's that sound? You know, right? You'd all leave, right? I mean, but that, that's how it worked in the first century. So when G, it says Jesus sat down, this is keying us off that this is going to be a teaching moment. Okay, that what Jesus is about to do is not simply about meeting a physical need in this crowd, but it's also a teaching moment for his disciples then and for us today, okay? And we're told that the Passover was at hand. Now, the Passover was the Jewish feast of salvation that occurred once a year. And in fact, if you've ever wondered, how do we know that Jesus' ministry was three years long? You ever wondered, like, you always hear people say that, like, oh, he was 30 when he started in three years of ministry. How do we know that? Well, we know that because John records him participating in three different Passovers, the only reason we know that it was three years is he went to Passover three times and it happened once a year. Okay, so it is the, the feast of the Passover. This is the most important holiday in the Jewish calendar. Okay, this is when the Jews remembered their deliverance from Egypt by the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. So for them, it was sort of like 4th of July and Christmas together. All right, it was, it was the holiday of holidays. And just as Christians think about Bethlehem in December, Jews thought about the Exodus during Passover. Does that make sense? Like, this is what is on their mind. This is the piano music playing in the background of their souls is the Exodus story. But ex the Exodus and the Passover for the Jews was different than Christmas is for Christians. Because, see, the Exodus was a complex event for them. It was, it was a time of rejoicing because they looked back and they remembered how God delivered them with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, but it was also a time of sorrow because they looked around and realized that they were oppressed again, right? They looked around, they said, there was a time that God delivered us and he led us through the Red Sea and he provided for us in the wilderness and he led us into the promised land, but then we rejected him as king, then we bowed down to false gods, we refused to repent, and so he gave us over into exile. And now we're oppressed and we're conquered and we're, and we're dispersed over the face of the earth. So for them, Passover called to mind some really happy memories and also some really, really sad realities. And I think Christmas can be that way for a lot of people today. Right? I don't know what Christmas is like for you. It might be a joyful season, but it also might be a painful season. Right? For some people, Christmas is a season of, man, of really happy memories of, of things that you're celebrating, and that's good. But it can also be a reminder of all the things that you don't have. Right? Like, hey, this is the first Christmas without grandpa. Or this is my first Christmas divorced, right? Or, the, or this is my first Christmas without the kids at home. Or maybe it's just a reminder of a hunger in your life. Like, man, I'm still single. I thought I'd be married by now. Man, we, we really want to have kids and God just hasn't made that happen for us. So, so just like then, just like Passover was kind of a complex season for the Jews, I think Christmas can be a complex season for us today. It can make us feel an acute need in a way that other seasons don't. Verse 5, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? So Jesus saw this crowd. He knew that they had been with him for multiple days. They had eaten all that they had. He knew that they were hungry. So he asked Philip, one of his disciples, hey, where are we going to buy bread so that all these people may eat? Now, I want us to notice something really, really important about the character of God from this verse. Notice this. Jesus took notice of the hunger of his people. Jesus took notice of the hunger of his people. He felt compassion for this crowd, and he was unwilling to remain indifferent or uninvolved. And I think that's really important because you might feel like this crowd this morning. All right, I certainly do. This week was kind of a crowd week for me. It's like you're trying to follow Jesus. Like you're, trying to, you're trying to follow Jesus. You're trying to be like the, the man Jesus wants you to be. You're trying to be the woman Jesus wants you to be. You're trying to raise your kids. You're trying to man, make a living. Like you're trying to follow Jesus and you're worn out and you're hungry. And you're like, do you even care? Like you say like, hey, come unto me, all you who are heavy and, and, and weary, and I will give you rest. And you're like, I don't feel that way. Like I'm following you, Jesus. I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. I'm wandering around to listen to you and I'm hungry. Do you even care? Right? Do you care that I'm hungry? Do you care that I'm, I'm practically physically hungry? Do you care that I'm emotionally hungry, relationally hungry, financially hungry? The question is, does Jesus care about you? Does the Alpha and Omega care about your empty stomach? Well, atheism says no, right? Because atheism says there is no God. And so there's 
you know, you're just kind of fooling yourself. There's no one, there's nothing out there that cares about you. It's just, it just is what it is. Agnosticism says there might be a God, but we can't know for sure and we can't know him. So that's not really very helpful because it's like, ah, we don't really know if there is a God. Deism, which is kind of like what Thomas Jefferson believed, is like God is kind of this force. He's like the, the eternal clockmaker who set the world up and set the world spinning and then stepped away. But God doesn't interact in the world anymore. So atheism, agnosticism, deism all says, no, God, I mean, no, of course God doesn't care about you. Why would you even think that? But then Christianity comes along and the Bible says something so remarkable and so encouraging that I think we miss it sometimes. We're so used to it. But like, just try to get your head around this for just a second. This is what the Bible says about God, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who holds the cosmos together. This is what God feels about you. Psalm 33, 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears and his ears towards their cry. In Genesis 16, Hagar refers to God as El Roy, which is the God who sees me. In other words, when you feel most invisible and forgotten, God sees you. He witnesses your struggles and he comes alongside of you in them. I have a hard time believing that. You ever struggle to believe that? Like not intellectually. Like if you're here and, and you're a Christian, like I know I'm supposed to believe what the Bible says. But like emotionally, don't you have a hard time actually thinking that's true? Like when you've had a super hard week with your kids and it's like one kid has been sick and then they gave it to another kid and then they get, this isn't a personal testimony. And then they gave it to another kid and you're just like, my life is a nightmare. Like I'm in sickness purgatory. Like, I, thank you. <laughs> We're just gonna talk, Becca. Like, <laughs> Right? It's so frustrating. And you're like, I'm trying to like have friendships and I'm trying to like make progress and stuff. And I'm trying to like exercise and eat well, but like all of my kids are sick and there's nothing I can do about it. They're always at home and they always need things. And like, I wish I was more patient with them than I am. And like, I wish I could do more than I can. I just can't. And like in that moment, maybe I'm the only one that doesn't feel like God has seen me. Right? Have you ever had somebody betray you? Have you ever had somebody that you loved, that you cared for, that you invested in, and they just stab you in the back? and they malign you, and they say untrue things about you? In that moment, do, do you feel like God sees you? Right, maybe you're like really lonely. He broke your heart, she broke your heart. He, man, he, he is now dating that other girl that he said he wasn't interested in, but he is now, and you feel totally worthless. Like, I guess I'm not good enough. Like, I guess I don't have enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not smart enough to like hold on to his affections. At that moment, do you feel that God Almighty, the maker of the heavens and earth, sees you and cares about you and knows what you're going through? I, honestly, I struggle to actually experience that. But I think it's one of the most remarkable truths of Christianity. I mean, we sing about it all the time at Christmas, like the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. Man, that God didn't remain insulated from hurt. He didn't remain insulated from pain, but he came down into the world and he understands. Here's what's amazing about this text. Just as Jesus lifted up his eyes and he saw the hunger of the crowd, Jesus lifts up his eyes and he sees your hunger today. He sees how weary you are. He sees how stressed you are. He sees how worried you are about the future, about your kids about your relationship. He sees you and he cares. And we aren't promised that Jesus is going to satisfy every hunger that we have in life, but we are told that he sees, that he cares, and that he understands. It's really nice to be comprehended sometimes, isn't it? I have, um, I have a friend here in the church and, and we meet up pretty regularly and we're both kind of in the same stage of life. And um, it's just one of the, it's like just easy to talk, right? Because it's just like, we sit down, he's talking about, I'm like, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> right? And I say something, he's like, I know exactly what you're talking about. He said the other day, he was like, it's just nice to be comprehended sometimes, you know? And, um, and I, I think that's the same thing. Sometimes I don't really need anybody to help me with stuff. I don't need to have a situation fixed. I just, it's just nice to have somebody that's like, yep, I know what you're feeling. I know what you're going through. Isn't it true that sometimes you don't need someone to fix your situation. You just need to feel like somebody understands, like somebody sees it and is in it with you. Um, so last night at three in the morning, uh, my daughter Abigail banged on our door very loudly. Uh, I was like, there's, there's someone breaking into our home. No, it's a five-year-old. Um, 
And I, you know, I get up out of bed and I'm like kind of, you know, 70% awake and, and I open the door and she's looking at me. She just looks up at me and she just says, I had a nightmare. And I go, okay. And then she just turns around and walks back to her bed. <laughs> she, she, <laughs> like, she didn't want anything from me, you know, like she just, like, <laughs> just wanted to be comprehended, you know, um, just wanted to be comprehended. And I, I think there's really something in that, man, that, that sometimes, you know, it's like sometimes you're like, I... I don't need you to, God, I don't need you to give me a, uh, I don't need you to give me a spouse. I mean, I'd like one, like I don't, but I just need to feel like you understand. Like I just need to feel like somebody out there really gets me. And the, and the amazing thing about the gospel is that Jesus Christ comprehends you perfectly. He comprehends you perfectly because he's a partaker in the human experience, right? He's experienced all the hungers that you've experienced in life. And as such, he is a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, so one of the great benefits of salvation, one of the great, I don't know, compelling things about becoming a follower of Christ is that when you surrender your life to Jesus, do you know what he becomes? He becomes your shepherd, your good shepherd, your perfect shepherd. And it's the responsibility of the shepherd to know what the sheep are going through and to provide for their needs. Now, the shepherd doesn't always lead the sheep where they think he's going to lead them. The shepherd doesn't always provide for the sheep the way that they would provide for themselves. Man, if you have a good, perfect shepherd you can trust, man, that he is going to take care of you because it's his responsibility. So Jesus lifted up his eyes then, and Jesus lifts up his eyes today. But I think the natural question that arises from that is if Jesus sees and if Jesus cares, why doesn't he do anything? Right? If, I, if he sees this hunger that I have, if he has the ability to, to fill it, to satisfy it, why hasn't he? I think verse 6 gives us some, some answer to that question. He, Jesus, said this to Philip, remember he said, we're going to get all this food, to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. So James chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, and Hebrews chapter 12 tell us that God will test us to help us become the people he has created us to be. Right? So, so if the scriptures are true, then the hunger that you feel in your life is, is not exclusively negative but is an opportunity for you to be shaped in the image of Christ and to learn to find your contentment in him. Now, in the moment, it doesn't feel like an opportunity, right? When, when you're at home with sick kids, right? When, when your bills are bigger than your income, right? When, when people are saying unkind things about you, like it doesn't feel like an opportunity. It only feels like something that you want to get rid of immediately. And yet, oftentimes, it's the hunger in our life that God uses to draw us to himself. Isn't that true? How many times, tell me, raise your hand if you've heard this testimony. Maybe you have. My marriage was awesome. I was killing it at work. My kids were doing great. I was healthy and fit and I just realize I'm a wretched sinner who needs to be saved by Jesus Christ, right? Is that your testimony? Maybe. Good for you, right? <laughs> Sometimes that's true, but like more often than not, it's, it's hunger, it's need, it's hardship that shows us that we need a savior, right? That's, that's certainly my story. I, God did not save me out of a season of moral triumph. Like he saved me out of a season of great moral failure. Man, I, I had to go through the low moments. I had to feel the hunger of my soul Man, to recognize I need a savior, I can't do this myself. C.S. Lewis once wrote, we can ignore pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. What about you? But that's certainly been true in my life. So sometimes God allows a hunger to go unsatisfied to show us our need for salvation, right? To draw us to himself. Other times, God allows a hunger to go unsatisfied to invite us into deeper dependence and contentment in him. So I was talking to a member of our church, uh, man, this, this month about this, and um, she's in one stage of life and she'd like to be in another stage of life. And she, she told my wife and I, she said, you know, I, I spent some time kind of being bitter about that. Like there were some years in my life that I was, I was like upset, I was frustrated that I wasn't in this season of life that I wanted to be in. She said, but at this point, I, I still struggle with it, but rather than seeing it as something that I need to be frustrated or bitter about, I see it as an opportunity. 
as an opportunity to trust God and to find contentment in him. She said, I still ask God that he would give me that next stage of life, but I don't see this season as a waste anymore. I thought, man, that's premature. I think that's, I think that's someone who gets what James 1 and 1 Peter 1 and Hebrews 12 are saying. Man, that, that hard doesn't necessarily mean bad. That hunger is not only negative, but it's an opportunity to know Christ more deeply. So Jesus tests Philip. He says, where are we going to get bread for this whole crowd? I love Philip's answer. He's so honest. Philip answered Jesus, uh, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. So 200 denarii is 200 days of labor. So Philip's like, it would take eight months of my salary to feed all these people. And even if we took eight months of my salary to feed all these people, they'd each get like a cracker. Right? Now, did you notice this fascinating? Did you notice Philip didn't answer the question Jesus was asking? What did Jesus say? He says, where? What does, what does Philip say? He says, how? Are right, you ever been there? It's like, you know, maybe it's right there. You know God's got something that he wants you to do. He's, this is what I want you to do. Here's what we're doing, Philip. And you're just like, how are we going to do that? And Jesus is like, Philip, I didn't ask you how. I said, where are we going to get it? Right? I think that's a good kind of discipleship question for all of us. Is there an area that God has said, I want you to, I want you to lean in here, but maybe I'm holding back because I don't see how it's going to work. And I think what God has invited us to is, man, lean in, walk by faith, man, and see what he does. Here's what Philip does. Philip's is like, hey, Jesus, hey, I know. You're the son of God. I get that. I'm afraid you don't really comprehend the financial picture of your ministry currently. Like, we don't have 200 denarii of money. And even if we did, we're in the middle of nowhere, so there's nowhere to buy food. Like, it's not a Costco for miles, okay? Like, we, there's no way that this is going to happen. Um, and now what's interesting is that Philip had been with Jesus for two years, right? Like, Philip had seen some stuff. Like, how about John chapter 2? They're at this wedding. The wine runs out. Jesus takes 900 gallons of water, transforms it into 900 gallons of wine, right? You would think that after two years, Philip would be like, okay. He did some pretty cool stuff with the water and the wine. Wonder what he's going to do with this bread, right? Like he had seen Jesus's past power, but here's the problem. He failed to apply Jesus's past power to his present problem. You ever been there? Like Jesus has changed your life, right? If you're here and you're a Christian, and I know not everybody here is a Christian, but like if you're here and you're a Christian, Jesus has changed your life. Here's what's happened. He has removed your sin debt from you. When God looks at you now, he doesn't see a rebel. He sees a son or a daughter. He's filled you with the power of the Holy Spirit. He has helped you break through habits and chains and behaviors that are generational that you could never do on your own. He's maybe worked through you to see other people come to faith in Christ. He's worked through you to, I don't know, strengthen marriages and build up singles and do all kinds of different things. He's done an enormous amount in your past. The problem is we forget to take the past power of Jesus and apply it to our present problems. Isn't that true? but I don't have any bread, Jesus. Where are we going to get all this bread? And he's like, well, where do we get the bread the last time? Right? I, I think what faith looks like practically in our lives is looking at God's activity in our past and believing God for his activity in our future. That's what I think it is. And I think what fear says is even though God has acted in the past, he will not act in the future. And what Satan sows into our minds is like, there's no way that God will come through this time. This time is different. You can't trust him so you better not do anything. Isn't that what Philip is saying? Like, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know how this is going to work, so we better not do anything. Right? Jesus said, where? Philip said, how? So Philip gets it wrong. Andrew does a little bit better, okay? So yay, Andrew. All right, verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Anybody like that? Like you're known as someone's brother? You know, like, poor Andrew. I'm like, Andrew's like, come on! You know, like, anyway. one of his, I led him to Christ, one of his... One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, uh, but what are they for so many? So Andrew's kind of listening in. He says, hey, there, okay, so there's a kid here, and this kid has um, five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, am I the only one who's ever read this and wondered, why does this kid have such a massive lunch? Because like, who sends their nine-year-old with five loaves of bread? You know, it's like, what is going on? Uh, well, what, I, I literally was like, what, what is this going on? So I like looked into it. It's not like loaves of bread like we think, okay? Think like crackers. And um, barley was the, it was the absolute cheapest kind of grain that you could get. So barley was like the bread of the very poorest of the poor. So this is not like a kid who's like has a gigantic lunch. This is a kid with like, is a very poor kid with like five little crackers and a couple of fish. And it's not big fish. It's like, think like sardines. It's like these little
little tiny fish that came out of the Sea of Galilee that they would pickle, okay? And so this kid's got like five crackers. I mean, literally, it's like a can of tuna fish and some tortilla chips. That's like what we're talking about, okay? And Andrew's like, well, we got like this, we've got like this, you know, Lunchable here. Um, but like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what good this is going to do um, for, you know, for all these people. Uh, here's what's going on. John is intentionally contrasting the, the size of the need and the size of the hunger with the small amount of resources, okay? That's what John is doing. He's, he's like, hey, there's you know, 5,000 men plus women and children, thousands of people. And then there's just this, I mean, just this tiny amount of resources, just this, just this tiny lunch. And just as a quick aside, don't you, don't you sometimes feel that way? I don't know, like maybe you feel like you're, you're a parent and you're like, I just feel like I've got nothing. Like I'm trying to raise my kids to love Jesus and I just feel like I've got a Lunchable, right? Or like you're trying to like minister to your coworkers or you're trying to like lead a missional community or like be a salt and light, at, I don't know, at, at school. And you just, I mean, you just look around, it just feels like... I, there's like so much need, and I'm like this little, what in the world, like what in the world am I going to do? And I, I think this is supposed to be encouragement that when we take all that we have and we put it in Jesus' hands, man, he can do some pretty remarkable things with it. Okay, so Andrew's like, hey, man, this is what we've got. We, we've got a little, bit of, a little bit of food, verse 10. Well, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. So in the first century, you counted heads of household, okay, so that's why it's just just the men. It's not trying to be like disparaging. It's just how they worked. And so probably, you know, I don't know if there's a woman and a child for each person, maybe 15,000 people. And this is a lot of people. So Jesus says, okay, guys, great. He, they give him a Lunchable. I've got the Lunchable. And he's like, okay, have them all sit down in groups. We know from some of the other gospels, it was like groups of fifties and groups of a hundred. So get them all, get them all organized. Now, here's what's fascinating. Think with me for a second. At this point, the disciples have no idea what Jesus is going to do. You ever thought about this? Jesus is like, oh, great. Thanks for that Lunchable. Now you guys go organize them all and tell them that lunch is about to be served. And they're like, what are you talking about? You know, like, they're going to be so mad. Jesus says, you go ahead and obey what I've called you to do. You let me worry about multiplying the food. You go ahead and obey, and then I'll provide the miracle. It's interesting. This is actually a theme throughout the whole Bible. One of my favorite stories comes from Joshua chapter 3. Um, God's leading the people into the promised land. Joshua is the leader and they have to cross the Jordan River to get into the promised land. That was like the the border of the promised land. Um, And so, you know, they're all getting ready to go across, but it's um, flood season. And so, man, the text says that the river was like, it was overflowing its banks. It was deep. It was moving really fast. I mean, it was like very dangerous. You guys remember Oregon Trail? Anybody play Oregon Trail? Okay, thank you. Now you're all with me right now, right? And you could like ford the river, right? But like sometimes your boat would collapse and everyone would die if they hadn't died of dysentery at that point, right? Anyway, so that's what's going on. So they got, it's this raging river. It's like, don't think like the Ravana. Think like, I don't know, the Mississippi or something. So it's, it's raging. And, um, and God says to the people of Israel, he says, here's the deal. You go walk into the river and then I'll stop it. Now, I'm one of the people that, well, God, I, that's, that's one idea, God. <laughs> here's, here's another thought, right? What if you just went ahead and stopped the river? That's, that's interesting. And then we just walk across. That seems like a better plan to me, right? That's not how God works. He says, nope, you go step into the raging river that is going to carry you downstream to your death, and then I'll stop it, right? And sure enough, they go step into the river, and God stops it, right? And they go to the promised land. Now, why does God do that? Like, why isn't Jesus like, oh, great. All right, guys, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna multiply all the bread, okay? And then once it's all multiplied and we have it all like organized, you know, then it's gonna be a buffet and then everybody's gonna walk through the buffet, right? Like, why not do that? I, I think it's because God is teaching us something about faith, right? He's teaching us like, hey, I want you to just go ahead and obey the thing I've called you to do before I tell you how I'm gonna provide. And we've probably, we've probably all got something like that in our life, don't we? There's like some area, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a habit, maybe it's forgiveness, I don't know what it is, but there's some area in our lives that God is like, hey, this is what I want you to do. And we're waiting because we're like, but if I do that, what about all this other stuff? And Jesus is just like, hey, I just, I want you to step into the river and then I'm going to stop it. Okay. So that's what he says to his disciples. Obey first and then I will provide. Verse 11. So Jesus then took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. And we're told in the other gospels that he actually gave them to the disciples and the disciples distributed them. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. So Jesus took the lunch, he thanked God, and then he multiplied it to the degree that thousands of people 
Men ate all that they wanted and were satisfied. And there were 12 baskets of leftover from this one tiny lunch. Now, on a theological level, I mean, this is, it's just a staggering testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ. I mean, just the, the amount of sheer energy required to multiply that much matter is just breathtaking. Right? That, that Jesus, I mean, it's so, it's so, I mean, <laughs> understated, isn't it? There's like no fanfare. There's like lightning doesn't strike. Jesus doesn't recite an incantation. Like he just, I don't even know how it worked. He just multiplies all this bread and multiplies all this food. It is, it, John is just clearly demonstrating that just like Yahweh fed the people of Israel with bread from heaven in the wilderness, Jesus as Yahweh is feeding the people of Israel with bread from heaven in the wilderness. I mean, that's what, theologically, that's what John is saying. This is a clear claim to the deity of Christ. If anyone ever tells you, man, that the, 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 the gospels don't claim that Jesus is God, then they just don't understand the gospels. It's just a, a clear demonstration, I am God. So I'm able to do things that, that normal people, normal prophets are not able to do. So it's working on a theological level, but it also is working on a practical level because I think what John wants us to see is like, he's like, hey guys, look at how huge the hunger was. I mean, that's a lot of people that are hungry and look at how small the resources were. And yet look at how profoundly satisfied these people became. And what happened in the middle was Jesus. And I think what we're supposed to do is I think we're supposed to apply that to our own lives. And say, like, you know, I'm sure you have something in your life that's a big hunger. Like, there might be something that just seems totally insurmountable to you. Like, I'm just, this is always going to be here. And I think what we're supposed to recognize from this is, like, man, if, if this crowd wasn't too big for Jesus, then whatever the area of our life isn't too big for Jesus. And I'm not saying he's going to snap his fingers and he's going to satisfy every single hunger that you have in your life. But I do think what this text leads us to believe is that he can So I think this is an encouragement towards faith, an encouragement to press in and to invite Jesus into the hunger of your life. Invite Jesus into those areas that ache. Invite Jesus into those those areas of your life that are hard, that you don't feel strong. Like Pastor Tanner talked about last week, the areas of gap, where what you're called to do and what you are, there's a big gap between them to invite Jesus into that area. And as I was processing this week, this really kind of got my business because I don't like doing that. You know what I like to do? I like to architect my life in such a way that I have no hunger. That's what I like to do. I just like to create situations where I'm strong, create situations where I have what I need, rather than inviting Jesus, man, into the areas that I'm just, I'm just struggling. And so this week, I actually just had to like, there's just some areas that I've been struggling with. And I just need to say like, Jesus, this is just hard. I don't know what to do with this. I don't like it. I don't want, it. I don't want this. I want this to be gone. And I think what the scriptures are encouraging you to today is like, if if you've got that area, and most of us have something, right? Maybe you don't right now, maybe you will in the future, but like most of us have some, it's like that one thing. Man, it's just hard, it just comes up, it just aches and and it's painful. And I think it's like, application would be invite the power and presence of Jesus into that. Lord, I don't know if you're gonna satisfy this hunger right away. I don't know if you're ever gonna satisfy this hunger, but I know that you can, and I I know that you care. And one of the practical things that I think is interesting from this text is the way, is the way that Jesus met the hunger of the people. Do you notice this? It was his power at work through his people. It starts and ends with the disciples. Jesus multiplies the food, but then he gives it to the disciples and the disciples distribute it. And then the disciples collect all the leftovers. And oftentimes that's how Jesus kind of satisfies our hunger today. Man, sometimes you're the crowd and sometimes you're the disciples. Like sometimes you're the crowd and, and you, you have a hunger for relationship, right? You're really, really lonely. And, and sometimes God says, okay, great. I'm gonna bring this group along that's gonna become your community. And so I'm actually gonna satisfy your hunger through my disciples. But other times it's the flip side of that and you're the disciples and Jesus works through you to satisfy the hunger of someone else. And you say, hey, this man, this person has a real financial need right? And you have been blessed financially. And so I want you to meet their need. I want you to satisfy their financial hunger. So sometimes you're the disciples, sometimes you're the crowd. Pastorally, what I would say is if, if you're always the disciples, you probably need to let other people care for you. And if you're always the crowd, you're probably not pulling your weight. But in the body of Christ, we're, we're called to love and serve one another, to one another, one another, 
right? And as a follower of Jesus, we are simultaneously needed and needy, right? So I just want to encourage you, maybe there's a way that you, that you just need to own the fact that you're the crowd this week and you need to reach out to somebody and say like, hey, I just, this is what I'm going through. Can you just, can, can we just meet up? Or maybe, maybe God's putting something on your heart right now, or it's been in your mind, like a way that you can be the disciples to someone else's crowd, and you just need to go through with it. And you just need to say, I just need to bless that person, reach out to that person, encourage that person. All right, verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So this crowd says, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. What, I mean, what is that all about? Well, you've got to remember it's the Passover, okay? So in the Passover, the people are all thinking about the Exodus. And Moses was the man in the Exodus, okay? Like Moses was the prophet that God raised up, that delivered the people. He defeated Egypt. He, you know, he was the one who received the law from God on Mount Sinai. He was the one who split the Red Sea, water from the rock, man in the wilderness. I mean, Moses was the man, okay? And right before Moses died, he told them in Deuteronomy 18, he said, one day... God is going to raise up a prophet like me and he's going to save you and deliver you and provide for you in a way that's even more complete than I have. Right, right before he dies, Moses says, guys, one day God has shown me that he's going to raise up a prophet that's like me, but better than me, a truer and better version of me. The problem was that prophet never came. I mean, the people went into exile, the people, the people were hurting, the people were aching, the people were faithless. And so what began to happen is year after year at the Passover, the people would get together and be like, maybe this is the year. Like maybe this is the year God raises up the prophet and the prophet's gonna deliver us from oppression in Rome and the prophet's gonna establish us as an autonomous nation and the prophet's gonna give us all the things that we don't have. The prophet is gonna satisfy all of our hunger and relieve all of our pain and minister to all of our ache. And here's Jesus, bear with me, on a mountain preaching God's word like Moses feeding people with bread from heaven, like Moses, during Passover. <laughs> so the people are starting to make the connection. And they're like, this is the guy. Like, this is the prophet. This is the one that we've been waiting for. And you're like, fantastic. This is a great moment. And then Jesus leaves. Like, what is that about? Like, the people seem to be understanding, like, yes, this is, this is the guy. We should, we should follow him. And then Jesus leaves. Why does Jesus leave? The answer is that the people wanted Jesus to meet all of their practical needs. But Jesus said, hey, I came primarily to meet your eternal need. The people wanted Jesus to become their king. He was like, they were like, hey, take political office. If you can do this with bread, imagine what you could do with Rome. Over, overthrow Rome. Establish us as a people. Relieve our pressures and our challenges. Make us economically prosperous. Make us safe and secure. Man, give, give me a spouse. Give me children. Man, give me a job that I love. Man, heal my family. Keep us safe. Jesus, become our king. And Jesus withdraws from them. Because he's saying, look, the primary reason I came is not to relieve all of your practical hungers, but it's to satisfy your eternal one. And if, and if I were to do what you want me to do in this moment, I wouldn't fulfill the very ministry that I came to fulfill. You see, they wanted him to be the Passover lamb from the Exodus. They wanted an Exodus for themselves. And he said, I did come to be a Passover lamb, but not the one that you want, but the one that you need. I came to be an eternal Passover lamb who through my death would pay for your sins, who through my sacrifice on the cross would create a way through the sea of God's wrath so that anyone who takes the blood of the lamb and puts it over the doorpost of their house could become children of God. You see, Jesus cares about your practical hunger, but he came to satisfy your eternal hunger. Jesus cares about your practical hunger. He cares about my practical hunger, but he came primarily to satisfy our eternal hunger. And it's his commitment to our eternal hunger that allows us to trust him with our practical hunger. Does that make sense? Anyone that would go through what Christ went through so that you and I could be cleansed and reconciled and saved is someone that we can trust with the everyday things of our lives. I think that's the point of John chapter six right here. He cares 
but he came to meet the eternal hunger. But here's the, here's the problem. It was their problem then. It's often my problem. I'll allow you to decide if it's your problem. Um, we feel like our practical hunger is more important than our eternal one. Don't we? Like we feel like our everyday felt needs are more important than our forever needs. And the reason I know that is because here's what I think in my heart. Maybe you do as well. Um, if this one thing was resolved, if this one thing was met, then I'd be content. I wouldn't be stressed anymore. I wouldn't be anxious. I wouldn't be unfulfilled. I'd be satisfied. I'd live the abundant life. But here's the truth that we've all experienced. If and when God satisfies one of your practical hungers, it is replaced by a new hunger. Isn't that true? Like if you get married, it won't satisfy your soul. If you have kids, it won't satisfy your soul. If you get into med school, it won't satisfy your soul. If you're healthy and active into old age, it won't satisfy your soul. If you have a great group of friends, if you live close to your grandkids, if you make great money, love your job, take exotic vacations, and achieve your preferred future, you will still be hungry, and eventually you'll die. And so what Jesus comes to do is not meet and satisfy every single one of our practical hungers because he knows they're just going to keep piling up. But he came to do something for us spiritually so that our souls could be satisfied. See, friends, our world is full of products and people and places that promise to satisfy your hunger, but it's never enough. But the call of the gospel, the deep call of Christ, is to pursue contentment in him in the midst of your hunger. To be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every situation, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. To be able to say, man, I'm single, I'd like to be married, but I'm profoundly content in Christ. I'm married, and we'd really love to have biological children, but I'm, I'm profoundly content in Christ. I'm aging, and my, and my body is breaking down, but I'm profoundly content in Christ. Man, my, my life doesn't look like I thought it would look. Man, I've walked through tragedy and hardship and loss, but I'm profoundly content in Christ. Because Jesus Christ has satisfied your eternal hunger, you can trust him with your practical hungers. And so what I want to do is I just want to give us a chance to respond to that. And so if you would, um, yeah, bow your heads with me. I just want to give you an opportunity to in, entrust your needs to Christ. I, I just want to invite you to give him your singleness. Give him your infertility. Give him your anxiety about the future. Give him your eating disorder. Give him your loss. Give him your tragedy. Give him your loneliness. Give him your fear of authenticity. Whatever part of your life is that thing that aches and that hurts and that you just long to have satisfied, I just want to encourage you to give it to him. To invite his presence and power into those areas. And then to trust him based on the reality of the cross. Lord Jesus, thank you that you lift up your eyes and you see us. Thank you that the incarnation is the greatest demonstration of your compassion, your care that there is. Lord, I confess I often struggle. Lord, to invite you into my need and my hunger and my hurt. I know that there are many people in our church that would probably say that same thing. So Lord, in this moment, would you just minister to us by your spirit? Would you help us to believe that you see us and that you care? That you're not distant, that you're not cold. And that one day, because of what you accomplished for us, there will be no more hunger, there will be no more ache, there will be no more tears. Lord, we need you. We pray these things in your name.